thanks so much for um for having a chat with me today it's really helpful um so i'm going to be asking you all about tiktok and why you think it's kind of so popular and how it works so firstly then can you tell me why you think tiktok is such a popular app well i think there are lots of reasons why tiktok has found its its mojo in the last couple of years and I think it has to do with the fact that it brings together lots of really creative um, possibilities. I think that historically it sort of latched on to the development of the music industry and the way in which people consume music, but also the way in which music becomes popular. And of course, we've moved from a history, I guess, a historical setting where in the past we would record our own songs from the radio, we create our own mix tracks to then being able to be part of the actually part of the the environment in which music becomes popular in the past we were perhaps just consumers and recipients of that but we're now active parts in that process so as a song becomes viral on a platform like tiktok people people feel part of that historical development to become to becoming popular and i think that's a really enticing aspect of what the platform allows so that so a huge part of its success is that intimate connection with the music industry where people are then taking or able to take audio tracks and then be part of their recreation through either dancing or lip syncing. So I think that's central to it. Uh, and it's become incredibly successful at connecting in with other aspects of the entertainment industry, whether it's music, film or television. So I think that's a really fascinating part of what it does well and probably does significantly better than any other platform. Now, if you take all those things out of the platform, there's probably something like YouTube left or some or some other form of kind of video trans video communication. But I think that the stuff that does well and if you look at the information that TikTok provides, things like using tracks that are becoming popular um, is a big part of making sure your content does well. So so I think it's it's not just the platform itself, but it's also things like creativity so that you can edit videos i mean i discovered a really nice filter yesterday that was a comic book filter so you can transform yourself into a comic book character and i think that that creative editing is also another convergence within the platform and all these really advanced sort of creative functions are all within this single platform which i think no other environment does quite as well and do you think the pandemic has a bit of a part to play with TikTok becoming, I feel like it, it was already popular before the pandemic, but I feel like the pandemic kind of boosted it, really. I think it has had an impact for sure. We know that people have spent more time on screens over the pandemic. And I think certainly it's um, it's become, an, I mean, it's still, it's still interesting because I think still people, a lot of people don't know what it is or how to use it. So there are lots of, there are lots of users on TikTok that are not creators, they're consumers really, so they'll just access videos and watch them rather than make their own stuff. So I think a lot of younger generations certainly became very um, prolific on the platform over the pandemic, and that will have been a function of the additional screen time they will have had. But I think what's happened over that period as well is an increased professionalization of the platform too. So you see lot, lots more very established brands occupy the platform. I've noticed in the last sort of six months we've seen um, seen advertising elevated within the platform so that when you log into the environment now the first thing you see is an is an advert and that's been a progressive process over the pandemic what was also interesting was that they provided access to covid messaging so in actual fact it was um, it was it was providing a service that people were able to to access and try to understand a bit more about the pandemic and what was going on yeah and can you tell me how the kind of TikTok algorithm works? Well, that's an incredibly good question. And I think that uh, every every article I've read about the TikTok al algorithm says, first of all, says different things and also says that it's a very well guarded secret. Now, over the last couple of years, I think partly because the platforms become much more in the public eye, there have been um more so more transparency within the platform about how it works but it's a combination of things and the recipe whilst many will say it's not a sort of magical mysterious recipe it is a complex recipe so it's affected by all of the very uh, specific behaviors that you exert within the platform as a user that affects what you see and, and i think it's important to understand that 
as a user within TikTok, you have different layers of engagement with content. You have the people that you follow. You have the people that follow you. You have the videos that you scroll through. You have the things that you search for. You have the things that you comment on or, or like and and all of those behaviors, including ones that you may not think about sort of explicitly, like whether you watch a video to the end or how long you watch the video have an impact on what it is that you see or how well a video does. And those behaviors also have a historical timeline too. So it might be that let's say that on most of the videos that you watch, you only watch um, half of the duration of the video that will affect what sorts of videos you see. It might discover that you tend to watch videos of less than 10 seconds, anything more than that, and you don't engage with the content. So then the that the algorithm will learn to respond to that and present you with content that's also of that sort of length. So I think the key thing that's interesting is its capacity to respond to your specific behaviors in quite a lot of detail. And then also we haven't talked about the content you create as well or whether you don't create content. So we're talking about probably a num you know, nearly at least a hundred different variables that are affecting what you see or and what does well. There's also talk about a beauty variable as well, that some theory is that you that it's it particularly elevates the content of people that have symmetrical faces. Now, I don't know whether that's true. I think there was some study about it, but obviously I think it's also fair to say that as a brand, it's trying to it's trying to position itself as a platform that is very much on trend. So so in the same way that I suppose other brands that, that cover such data try to then manage their persona and the content people see, I think similarly, it's trying to ensure that the content it see is contemporary, is cutting edge, it is trying to engage with the zeitgeist, if you like, and, and create it as a result of it. So it probably does have an impact on those sorts of things too. But it but it also may be affected by by things that you've told it, like how old you are and what sort of person you are, what sorts of things you like, and all those things will affect what you see. Amazing, it's so interesting. I just find it fascinating. Um, it is. So going back to kind of like sounds then and, and well, the audios, can you explain what kind of it means for a sound to go viral on, on TikTok? Yeah, so I, I guess you're talking about the the way in which you can add a specific sound to your video. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think it's, it's, there's also a degree of, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that, um, that the entertainment industry has become increasingly wedded to TikTok. And I'll give you a very simple example, and this is anecdotal, but I think it's also probably likely to be some data that can support it. I noticed over the pandemic period, um, if you listen to the the uh, morning br the breakfast program on Radio One, you would often hear the presenter Greg James talk about the fact that um, this song has gone viral on TikTok. And of course, what's important to know is that the producers of radio shows like that and are connected to that entertainment industry that's also part of TikTok's world. So these are not. It's never just one person saying mentioning TikTok just randomly because they think it's interesting, there is a clear sort of working relationship between these environments. And of course, if you are a media company, you will have invested into utilizing that platform too. So the BBC will have a strong uh, TikTok presence across a variety of its products. So I think there's, there's often sort of the belief that these things just happen out of nowhere and suddenly become viral. And there may well be examples that do that particularly well. But I think what's below the surface is actually a lot of positioning of pieces. I remember there was a there was a TikTok viral song from a couple of years ago, which I have to dig out because and I read I followed up the story as to how it became viral, and it was I I'll find the song for you. But it was um, the, the 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 musicians in it, I think it was an NME article. They talked about the fact that. They they seem to like promote it. They they set up like call centers for the song and were doing sort of personalized sort of feedback from audiences about the song. And they were they were trying to get it to go viral in a very manual way. And then it sort of grew very quickly. So um, so I think there's a lot of background activity that happens below the surface of any given sound that leads it to then become popular. And uh, and there's quite a lot of people trying to make that happen uh, rather than just sort of happen. I think I think it's very appealing as a consumer to think that you've jumped on a trend and that you're then part of that trend and somehow 
an actor and it becoming popular like you knew about it before it became like big and that's a real currency within the environment but i think it's not a true reflection of what's really happening that there are in fact nudges towards you seeing certain content that is trying to elevate and therefore becomes popular yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah <laughs> And there are, um, there are, of course, lots of users in TikTok that are doing just that. They are actually trying to jump on trends. And, and so you have this in, incredibly big population now that are trying to make stuff go viral and then feel that they're, they're sort of being part of something big. And I think that's also part of the mechanism that makes something grow, too. Yeah, exactly. And then there's that mysterious stuff. I saw a because, you know, I guess you're a TikTok user yeah yeah and then yeah i you know i wonder I'm, so i mentioned this tiktok research group that we have and i'm i'm of the view that whilst we are all are studying tiktok collectively each of us has a very different sense of what's happening in the platform uh, including what's big and what's not and it's interesting because if you i saw a tiktok actually yesterday which talked about the biggest tiktok account so the charlie account that's been there since the start and and um and yet there's some stuff that a colleague of mine who's based in Jerusalem has seen that he considers to be like the content that everyone sees in TikTok. And I'd never seen it. I mean, it's, it's so so that sense of what is prominent is very different. Um, and yet we may not be aware of that unless we actually talk outside of the platform about it and realize, oh, what I think is big is not not big at all. Like I give you one quick example. Have you seen anything around Greta Van Fleet? A little bit, yeah. A little yeah. bit. So I've seen a lot of that. So it was an SNL um, uh, recording that they did a couple of years ago, 2019. And the song, in my view, has gone really viral for them and doing really well. But, you know, I've watched the song as well. I've, I've watched it also on, I, like I saw a clip in TikTok. I then went to YouTube and watched the song and watched it a few times. And what you don't really know is how many other behaviors in other products also have an impact on what you're seeing. But certainly, I could quite believe that the amount of engagement I've had with that song in TikTok alone is affecting also my sense of how much content is created around that particular song. So, so my impression is, oh, everyone's seen this. This is big. Everyone's experiencing yeah. it. And actually, probably not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that can be quite scary as well, because um, you do kind of think it can become a bit of like an always like an echo chamber then, because yeah. you think it's just what you're seeing is what everyone else is seeing, but it, it isn't necessarily. Yeah, it is. And that's always been a sort of concern, particularly of the sort of algorithm driven digital age, which is, you know, relatively recent that we were in this situation where so much of the algorithm affects what we see. And um, and so much about the algorithm is unclear to us, including our perception of its existence, which I think is is something that is um, really obscure to many people. Like you really don't know <clears throat> quite how it works. You have a sense that it is working, and that's already quite helpful, but you don't really know how to intervene and disrupt it. Like I've seen on Facebook over the last few years, people would say that you only see around 25 people's content. And you know you might have 500 people that you're connected to, but you never see the content of the other 475. And and then people try different tactics, like the viral posts that say, if you post this, it will then, or if you like this, then then it will affect your algorithm. You'll begin to see much more content from a range of people. But those also feel like scams and viral viral things that are that are then designed. I think one of the things that we don't often think about is the the algorithms often designed to get people continuously thinking about. The platform and and so and because of that it sort of keeps you engaged with the brand of the platform which i think is a a further sort of layer of how we're sort of entrapped into it but um but i think that probably what also tiktok does very well that hasn't been done as well on um other platforms is how the how the interface works too so the scrolling through through content in a way that's more i think because it's it, it's it's essentially Instagram's tried to do the same with Reels. It's um, it's trying to capitalize on the interest people have to always be engaging with video. It's sort of a, a symbol of the, the the salience of video in people's lives. And you might sort of look back historically and say it's a bit like with your remote control channel hopping, but on steroids. <laughs> this is how the phrase will go. Yeah, 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so for this story, I've spoken to um, a, a singer in America and one of her songs went viral on the platform. But for her, she says it happened quite randomly because it was like two years after the song was released and someone in um, someone else in America had just posted like a video. I don't know if it was like a dance or mm. something to it. And then it kind of took off from there. Um, so I suppose my question really is that could this be seen as kind of a, a positive thing for people in that industry, you, you know, as a way to promote themselves? And I suppose, as you say, as you said before, these things, it might seem like they happen organically, but mm. but they don't. But there are some people who've like launched careers uh, from TikTok because they've had songs go viral, that that kind of thing. So, yeah, what, what are your thoughts around that, really, about it being used uh, in that way, I guess? Well, my first thought is, I wonder what happened to the the user who made the video dancing to it or whatever it was, because I think that the platform, part of the appeal of the platform is the idea that as a user, you can go viral and you become the content creator then as a, as a result of your amazing sort of either response to a, a music track or some other piece of content. And I think we we are very much in an age where that form of sort of celebrity making is is what many young people sort of aspire to like i think of i think of uh, youtubers or streamers you know the streamers are becoming personalities themselves but the real personality is the gaming content you know they are they are the additional layer but the product is, is the streamed content really without that there is no youtuber so i think that that i mean celebrity becoming a celebrity has always been a kind of form of myth making but I think what's appealing to users of TikTok is the belief that if I do something with this piece of content, I can become the celebrity. And it sort of it reminds me a bit about some of the early sort of discussions about people like Paris Hilton, the sort of socialites that became famous for being out there invisible. And I think that there's something similar with TikTok by drug by and it's it's partly connected to, I think, people's belief that that at some point you may have, you may your engagement with some creative content may may be sort of uniquely or or maybe maybe insightful in ways that people haven't quite realized yet and but you're showing it to them in a way that allows them to appreciate how special it is and so that you that you then become this sort of intermediary for status for value for things that that people didn't realize about something that's out there and, and i think that's Again, historically, if you think about it, and the people that I know that are massive sort of music fans and connoisseurs of music will will sort of base their status on the on the belief that they understand music in a way that other people do not. And you kind of share that and and you sort of reveal a, a sort of insight into something. So I think that in some respects that that example that you describe is is an example of somebody trying to uh, someone who's had some insight into something that, that they're then sharing with others to hopefully draw attention to how special it is but they become then part of that of that making it's probably not so different from actually if you think back to traditionally how popular music evolved where you have a, a sort of a, a scout a manager an r a and r that go out and find things and so today's tiktokers are like the music scouts that go out and find the things that are then brought to people's attention and then defined as special or particularly valuable yeah yeah that's really interesting I suppose that almost that kind of like evolution there of how people are just I suppose engaging with music really yeah and I think that is a big part of it the musical side of of TikTok which is really interesting because I think that there are there is such a variety of content in TikTok now from people that are you know either sharing science or, or anything really is i better see I, I follow one person that works at one of the museums in london and she shares videos about history and and i think there is such a variety of content that's out there now and it's become it's become the the catch-all place for all organizations so so it has evolved significantly beyond just the sort of musical dancing lip-syncing side of things but um but that's still such a big part of the ecosystem um 
And the other thing that we haven't talked about as well is the the sort of live economy within TikTok. And so if you want to go live in TikTok, you have to have 1000 followers, which is already really interesting because it, it then gives people a sort of target to reach in order to really use the platform in full. And I think it is actually the live content that's really significant about the platform. Um, and it's you don't I don't think you have, I think on, on uh, YouTube you have to have 100 subscriptions to be able to go live and there's other sort of limitations like having your own URL in in YouTube you need 100 subscriptions or something like that but it's but it's then trying to encourage your user community to aspire to being a, a more fully functioning user and that that's part of the, the the sort of economy of the platform that it's not just about getting the content into the platform it's about giving your users uh, targets, goals that they can reach to level up their experience. And I noticed in uh, Google, actually, Google now has a similar sort of principle. I, I don't know if you noticed, they have a system where you can get points and you can then sort of level up to different things that then may translate into money, I think. But it's it's trying to engage your user base by getting them to aspire to progressing within the platform. And I think that's an interesting component of it. Yeah, yeah. And so is that something I hadn't really considered, like the the live aspect and the mm. the requirements? Yeah, that is interesting. And with going back to music for a second, then, do you think there is kind of a danger that, and I suppose it's not just music, it can be across anything, really, um, any kind of medium, that people will be trying to now tailor content more to TikTok to try and get something to trend or uh, to kind of fit that um, algorithm, I suppose, if that's even possible. Uh, do you think it, it kind of has a risk of taking away from like originality if people try to fit in too hard, I suppose? It's a great question because, again, I, I want to go back to sort of the history of, of media production because you know the the birth not maybe not the birth of radio but radio certainly created a sort of three minute third three minute three and a half minute track it was something that that was a structure then that artists had to fit into in order for their record to be played and and so you know i'm a big prince fan and i remember that one of the sort of his his frustrations with the radio industry was that if you didn't fit in the three and a half minute sort of category with the song, you wouldn't get your song played. And he would play, he would create tracks that would be seven, eight, nine minutes long and they wouldn't be heard of because you can't get them on a radio edit. So I think that his, and the same might be said also of vinyl, you know, the, the size of the disc limited the duration of your song. So historically, all media production systems have had specific parameters of what's possible and and even if you go back to sort of classical music days in the theater and i suppose you know there, there's, there's mozart so one of there are some there are some really uh, very old classical uh, compositions where the ring cycle yes the, the ring cycle i think is a 12 hour piece and you know you go to it over different periods but it's uh, it's still set up to be that duration and it's supposed to be that long and so there are often there are some situations where you have artists that have in some form sort of push back against those restrictions and then sort to create on the basis of what, what they thought the work requires. But still there's always, you know, it has to be packaged into four nights at the theater in, in its modern composition. So I think that it's, it's, it is doing in that sense, something similar to what's always been the case. But I think what's more likely today is that you have more, more people around a, uh, a song that's been created for popular distribution and consumption that are thinking about what component of this song could be used as a 15 second TikTok video. And there's probably a lot more in not, a lot more people in the industry that are working to repurpose that content across platforms like TikTok. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, bro, I think that's pretty much um, all the questions I've all right. had. And I feel like we've covered a lot as well. So. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much. It's been really interesting.